So thank you for coming to today's iteration of the brief. Uh, this is the November meeting of 2020. As if we didn't have enough things threatening our life out there with COVID and the world and global warming, um, we also have to talk about obesity as the epidemic and life-threatening entity that it is. And so today we're going to talk about the things that can go right, the things that can go wrong, the options therein, and dispel a lot of stupidity about obesity, um, both as an epidemic in this nation, but also as a pandemic of its own right, worldwide, um, and discuss really what things are in a real way, not by advertising, not by popular vote, but by science. So our program's goal here, as you can see for yourself, is for you to live a happier, healthier, more productive, better quality of life, by resolving or improving medical conditions that are associated with carrying too much body fat around. If it was just a matter of the weight itself and the appearance, big, tall, short, small, you're all the same beautiful people you were born yesterday, tomorrow, and thereafter. Unfortunately, though, the body doesn't see it that way when it comes to carrying too much body weight and diseases follow. So our practice here at Evans Army Community Hospital in March of 2019, we were surveyed by the American Society for Metabolic and Bariatric Surgery, and we were certified as a center of excellence. What that entails is that the audit came in and determined that not only was our volume adequate enough, but our complication rate and our success rates were on par or better than everybody else out there doing it. Moreover, we treat the whole patient, not just a stomach surgery where you like medical tourism, come in, get it done, go home. This is about treating the mind, about treating your heart, about treating your brain, in addition to your body. That maximizes your safety before surgery, and it optimizes your success after surgery. So we received that designation. I'm very, very proud of that. Our program was founded in 2004 by Dr. Bob Wilcox, who worked here as a contractor and was on active duty for a short time. Um, he was a contractor here for about 15 years, and he was the first one to do the program here and, and head it all the way through. The first gastric bypass, he used to tell me, I can't remember exactly, but it was somewhere on six to nine hours as long as I took the first one around in 2004. So we've come a long, long way since then about how we do these surgeries and what we have to offer. As I mentioned, there's a multidisciplinary panel of people, most of which have a point of contact that's their lead. We meet as a group and we report to the hospital command um, pretty much every month except for December and July typically. Um, the personnel on there uh, are listed above, so I am a verified weight loss surgeon by that society. Um, beyond that, our bariatric coordinator, Ms. Charlotte Andrews, is in the back of the room. She's a PA, previous active duty, and um, joined our team. Mr. Green, who you saw in here setting things up, he's over there in the back corner. He's our bariatric nurse. We have a whole slew of mental health professionals that are part of this team. We have the wellness center here, which is handed up, headed up by Brandon Waller, who's in the back of the room there. Uh, the dietitian, our lead, is Yvette Malcolm. Um, Y'all may or may not have met her already at some point in time. She has her whole team that are involved. When it comes to operative safety and patient safety, anything that you do that, that is volume in terms of repetition, consistency, and competency breeds safety. It's just like flying a plane. You've got a crew that knows what they're doing, they do it every day, and they do a lot of flights. This is much the same. So our OR team, as a certified weight loss surgery tech. She has a backup in case she's not there. The nurse and staff in the, um, the post anesthesia recovery unit, up on the family care ward, in the ICU, all follow protocols which build in safety and consistency in your care. That was also part of our designation. We have a support group, and for those of you who have very complicated medications in your profiles, we also have a clinical pharmacy team. It's headed up by uh, Jenna Johnson, who's a pharmacy. So, the things that we're going to talk about today are what is obesity, what are the challenges that come with that, uh, what is it costing you and or society, what are the surgical options uh, to include risks and benefits both. We'll kind of summarize that at the end and then talk about where we go from here. So what is obesity? Obesity is a disease of excess fat storage with a number of associated diseases that come with that. But plainly, it's too much percentage body fat and then the harm that comes therein. It's multiple things that got us here, not just one simple thing. It's lifelong. It tends to get worse over time, no matter what you try and do. I think everybody's been there on the I lost 20 pounds and gained 30 wheel, right? Uh, we'll talk about why that is. It could be potentially life-threatening from the diseases that come with it. 
and very, very costly before it's over. I put lifelong in bold up there. I'm going to touch base here in a slide we're going to camp out on for a little while because I want you to understand that your body, your body, your body and your brain as an, as an organism, not as a human being with a soul, but your body has a certain thermostat, I believe, that's set for percentage body fat. And so much like an alcoholic who's reformed or a drug addict's reformed, they say, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, because in their brain chemistry, that exists. I believe in human beings with obesity, it's the same thing. So once a big person, always a big person, no matter what your body weight is. That is your brain, the underlying animal mechanism inside you that drives that. So it does tend to be a lifelong thing you have to fight and defend yourself with. What is morbid obesity? A lot of people don't like the term morbid. It sounds very judgmental. Morbid is a medical term that simply means harmful to your health. So the level of obesity that's harmful to your health is what we can consider to be clinically severe or morbidly obese. And it took a number of years for us to be able to define exactly what does that mean. The initial kind of guesses was, well, if you are 100 pounds overweight, then we'll call it that. And they went, what about a big dude and a small lady? That's not the same 100 pounds. They said, okay, well, maybe twice the weight you're supposed to be. Um, and then that, that kind of didn't work out either because there were weightlifters and bigger you know, people out there whose body muscle indexes were much higher. So then we came up and said, well, why don't we use this surrogate called the body mass index? That was designed in the early 90s as a surrogate for percentage body fat. It's not a percentage or a number, it's just a ratio. And it relates your height to your weight so that a big tall man and a short woman, their ratio number is the same when we start talking about guesstimates at their body fat. To determine someone's true percentage body fat is actually very costly and very time consuming. And even now, in the best of technologies, it's not a perfect art. We've tried everything from swimming pools, with water displacement, to calipers on the arms, to now, what we use now is probably the best ever invented, which is the bod pot. So it sucks everything down and does uh, calibration measurements based upon that. So morbid obesity is defined as a body mass index over 40 or over 35 if you have a condition associated with your weight that threatens your life. The National Institute of Health, when it came up with this guide, put people typically in a five point range uh, that came into kind of acceptable or ideal range was kind of 20 to 25. Uh, 18 and a half to 25, somewhere in there. 25 to 30 was overweight, 30 to 35, class one obesity, 35 to 40, class two obesity, over 40, class three obesity or morbid obesity. And then class, uh, the next class up from that, I guess medicine just wasn't that smart. We ran out of adjectives. We just added the word super to it. And so that might, I hope, come back on. Okay. Um, it may flicker like that. It did that a little while ago. Um, so they call that super morbid obesity. And then I was reading a, a research article here recently. It was talking about body mass index and mortality rates associated with BMIs over 60. And they called that super, super morbid obesity. And I'm like, can't you come up with anything more original like super duper? Or I think people kind of get the point by right now. Um, you don't need to keep insulting them and add more adjectives to it. I think we get the point. So we're going to camp out on this slide a little bit. I think this is probably the most important educational slide in the deck. I mentioned just a few minutes ago multifactorial. There are multiple things that play into our bodies getting where they're at, how they got there, and why they stay there. And so we're going to touch on that a little bit. Let's start with the genetics. Can we all agree that we have genetics and that we are animals born into this planet? That doesn't mean we don't have a soul, we don't have higher thinking. But at a baseline level, we're a series of chemical reactions in our bodies, just like birds, just like snakes, just like uh, apes. It's all the same, right? Just degrees of, of um, kind of more sophistication as they went. Well, what if I told you that um, being an animal and thinking in those terms, that genetics plays into all of your behaviors, particularly when placed into an environment? I'll give you an example. Can we agree that Let's say alcoholism can be genetic, it can be family genetic. You're kind of inherited into it, right? And so with those genes, does that mean that you're gonna to have to be an alcoholic? No, there's something called penetrance. What that means is you have to have a lock and a key. The key's gotta turn it on. So if you're born a genetic alcoholic, but you're raised in a small village in 
South America that doesn't have alcohol and is never going to see alcohol, well, you're never going to be an alcoholic then. The key will not turn that lock. Right? So it's, it remains kind of hidden in the background. Obesity, we're finding, is much the same way. There's a hundred different alleles that have been identified on the human genome that are related to obesity. And those obesity factors in your genes can relate to hormones and behavior. So how many people know someone they're like, he or she can drink 10 gallons of soda and they won't gain a pound, but if I sniff it from across the room, I put on two pounds. Right, because maybe their genetics is, they don't have that lock and key mechanism like you do for high fructose corn syrup, or for pasta, or for whatever it is that puts weight on you quickly and doesn't on other people. We are all genetically diverse, so we are all the same animal at the end of the day. Um, if you look at the effect of certain foods on your behavior, there is mechanisms, I mean, can we all, it's been studied quite well to know, all those corporations out there selling you this stuff, they're looking for the magic ingredients of salty and sweet, right? Salty and sweet. Processed stuff, cheap and not healthy for you, which by the way is the definition of a drug, right? One and the same. So if you move from that over to behavior and how that affects behavior, proof in point, if you look in our world at all animals, all animals, there are only two types of animals in this universe that fight obesity. Does anybody know what those are? I'll tell you. Number one is humans. And number two is a little bit of a trick. It's animals fed by humans. You won't see a big cheetah. You won't see a bird too big to fly, a snake too big to slither, a cheetah too big to run, because in their world, in their biochemistry, they eat nature. They don't have these other mechanisms at higher levels with brain hormones and chemistries. They live day to day to do one thing and one thing only that animals are always driven most to do, which is survive above all else. So if you think about your body as an animal, one of the postulated mechanisms here, what's happening, is as you put on weight, weight is simply body fat which is stored energy. It's energy that's not being used. 10,000 years ago, we fought famines and people died by scores of millions. You go back to the 80s in Ethiopia, there were famines and people died right, every day. From your body's perspective that just wants to survive, if you have all that excess storage, that's survival during a famine. And if you lose that weight, you start burning it off, at the basic level of your brain, what does it think? You're in a famine, and if you survive it, what does it want to do? It wants to put the weight back on you to get ready for the next famine, so that you survive, right? So it will drive behavior. There's also some degree, as I mentioned kind of in the genetic, about calorie impact. Probably a lot of different terms for it, but one I'll drive here is I'll call it caloric impact. Not all calories are built the same, and how your body sees those calories and what it does with it also can drive behavior in your health. For example, I, in 21 years of doing surgery, have never met a big person that I asked, how did you get here, and they said, oranges. One day I started eating oranges and I couldn't stop. Started packing on pounds. Never happened. I have heard fast food, soda, pizza, processed pasta, so on and so forth, right? So why would that be? If you're putting 100 calories of donuts in and you're putting 100 calories of broccoli in, it's calories in, calories out, right? That's what the whole world's been telling you all along. Right? Shaming you in obesity that we all fight. They're going, you just need to eat less and exercise more. Who's heard that before? Right? I'm going to choke somebody if I hear that one more time. If it was that simple, you want to stop and go, gee, why did I think of that? If it was just that simple, don't you think we'd all do that? Yeah, I think we've all tried to do that, and it doesn't work out. Part of that 
I believe is because of the impact of calories on your body. Some things, with our body having been on this planet for tens of thousands of years, when you put something in it, it needs nutrition to survive. It's number one goal. It needs vitamin C. It needs calcium. It needs biotin. It needs these ingredients, zinc, all of these things for you to survive and be healthy, right? So if you put something into it that it identifies as food because it knows what it is, broccoli, a piece of beef, we've been eating these things tens of thousands of years, it takes that in, it sees what nutrition is there, it absorbs that, let's go with the rest, your body processes that differently than a potato chip, where it sees a bunch of chemicals. Think about how long processed food has been on this planet. Think about that. It's only been here 50 years, 60 years maybe. When the obesity epidemic started, 1980, processed foods really started in the market, late 50s, early 60s. Started being inculcated into culture, Betty Crocker, who wasn't a real person by the way. Right? So, when you start seeing the processed foods is when things start to change. You start eating potato chips, sodas, things with chemicals in it. Your body doesn't know what that is. So I postulate what it does is it goes, I see the 100 calories that you just gave me, but I still need my zinc and my iron and my calcium. So I'm going to deposit that as fat, but I'm still hungry because you haven't given me the nutrition I need. So, you can sit and eat things typically that aren't good for you and keep eating them and keep drinking them and not stop. You know what happens when you eat too many oranges? When your body stops and goes, I know what that is, I got all the vitamin C I need. You eat one more orange, I'm sending it back where it came from. It's coming back up. You can't sit and eat too many oranges. Your body will make you vomit it up. It doesn't want any more of it. It doesn't do that really with pizza or hot dogs. Like you said, eat 50 something hot dogs in three minutes in a contest, they don't throw it up. It all goes down, right? So, caloric impact and obesity in animals, those hormones that I referred to and how that affects your behavior. So there's primarily two hormones in your body and these are probably the biggest things for you to know in this. There are two hormones in your body that talk about appetite, and satiety, or feeling full, feeling like you don't need to eat or drink anymore. Those hormones for your body hunger, it's called ghrelin. The one for your brain, which is satiety or not needing to eat or drink anymore, is called leptin. So, you ever had a scenario where you're sitting there and your brain, this is what happens when you go on a diet, by the way, your brain starts telling you, go get something to eat. And you stop and you think about it, you listen to your body and you go, I'm not hungry. I'm not hungry. I'm not, I'm not thirsty. Why? Your brain's going, but go get something to eat. Why that is? That's leptin. So that hormone is that, that thermostat of satisfaction in your body or where you're at in terms of its existence, its energy stores, its body fat. And I believe that leptin is the reason why diet purely diet and exercise alone, unsupervised, just do your best, fails. It fails over 95% of the time for everyone on the planet within two years. So you can't tell me for all the stereotypes of obesity, right? All the stupid ignorance out there. These are people that have no self-esteem, they're addictive, they're loathsome, they're gluttons, they're lazy. 95% of the planet's that? because we're all in the same boat together. We're all animals just the same. You can't tell me that the math works out for that, that everybody has those issues together in this universe. That just doesn't make sense. That's not smart. And you'll see later, if you play that out to 10 years, it's less than 2%. So for all the shaming that we do on each other, that people try to lose weight and they put it back on and you feel like a failure, and then people look at you like you're a failure, Right? It's nonsense. It's stupidity and ignorance. That's simply all it is. Women have estrogen and progesterone in your bodies in very high concentrations. I think we could agree it affects your behavior, does it not? If any man ever looked at you in a hard time of a month and said, it's all in your head, you just need to get over it, you'd probably want to choke him to death, right? For men, testosterone, very high in our body. Aggression, sex drive, right? It'd be like a woman telling you, like, you just need to turn that sex drive off, it's all in your head. 
They don't work like that, right? Hormones drive behavior. These hormones that come with hunger and satiety drive your behavior. And I truly believe, as sad as it sounds, for the most part, the data would support that once you get a certain weight going, and you get it going, 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 you can't beat it with willpower. You cannot. I'm sorry to tell you. There is no exercise program, there is no diet out there that has figured out for 98.6% of this planet how to sustain that for 10 years. 98.4%, right? It hasn't. Yes, there are programs that work. I'm not saying they don't. The wellness center here, but it's all factorial and it's supervised and it's professional and it's based on science. But that's not what all of us have to do every day, right? You ever, anybody ever watch The Biggest Loser? Do they lose weight when they go there? Universally. They all do. You notice they've never done the where are they now segment? They don't do, they've been doing it for like 16 seasons. Survivor brought back all the champions to compete against each other. Where's the where are they now for the biggest loser? Why do you think that is? Let them. The real world. When you're locked down on camp and you have a medically supervised diet and a professionally supervised exercise program, sure you're going to be successful. You don't have husbands and wives and kids and jobs and bills and nothing else to focus on. If anybody in here been in the military or have uh, spouses that are in the military, when did they get the healthiest as adults besides basic training? When they deploy. Everybody burns off weight and puts on muscle when they deploy. Why is that? Because most of them, the, they say that war is 90% boredom and 10% terror, right? So when you're sitting around with nothing to do and you're trying to kill time, you start getting healthy because all the other distractions are not that. But what happens when they come back home? It all comes back around and we end up back to where we started from if you're lucky, if not worse, right? The environment, the last factor that plays into here. Anybody who tells you that advertising doesn't work is also an idiot. But by the way, who says that the most is the advertising industry. They say it doesn't really work. I'm like, why do you spend billions of dollars on it every single year? It absolutely does work. It feeds things in your brain and in your psyche that drive your behavior, that, that leptin's telling you to go eat, and all of a sudden you see something on the screen, that's a hamburger or something inevitably, and you don't see like the broccoli industry advertised much, right? They, they don't. The stuff that's on there is corporate money that they're trying to make. And think about that for a second. Put that to the common sense test. Let's talk about the dollar menu at McDonald's or Taco Bell, right? A corporations, we're talking about a body, number one goal as an animal, survive. Corporations, number one goal, profit. They're there to make money. So if they're selling you something for a dollar, that means that the supplies that went into it, the time to make it, transport it, the staff in the place per hour to put it all together and assemble it and give it to you, and then have a profit margin in there is less than a dollar. What do you think you're actually putting in your body? Seriously, what do you actually think is nutritious that you're going to get for under a dollar after you suck all of that stuff out of there? Next thing in environment, portion sizes. Our salad plates now were dinner plates in the 1960s. Over the years, we have gone from six, seven, eight inch plates. The average plate now is hovering around 12 inches. So our salad plate now, that was a whole dinner to people in the 1960s. That is marketing, it is advertising, and it is feeding you foods that trigger hormones but don't actually give you nutrition, right? Very, very plainly. We now live in a world where our environment, particularly in America, but in Europe as well, has given you access and availability to food that is cheap and available everywhere. If you drive out of the gate and get on 115 and head north, the second intersection after Academy that you'll come to is Star Ranch, Cheyenne, something road right there. Of the four sections there on that intersection, one's a golf course. So of the other three, there are 11 places not including the grocery store, 
There are 11 places to get something to eat in that one intersection. That's just one intersection in all of Colorado Springs. There were towns in this country and in the world that didn't give you 11 options. Whole towns. You have 11 in one intersection. Not that far away. You don't believe me? Drive by there. Start counting. All right? The Loaf and Jug, Taco Bell, Little Caesars, Subway, Sushi Place, Seafood Place, Papa Murphy's, Jimmy John's, Thai Place, Dickie's Barbecue, the Shell Station, now the Valero Station. You get food there too. Right? Not including the grocery store. Count them up. 11. Right? It's everywhere you can't escape, no matter what you do. So it's in the environment all around you. It saturates you. And last, that takes us to our culture. What does every special event in this country evolve around? Weddings, anniversaries, birthday parties, Super Bowls, name it. Do people go, hey, a wedding anniversary, what y'all do? We went for a walk. No, we went to dinner. Right? What'd you do for your son's birthday? We got cake and ice cream, we had a big birthday party, ordered pizza. Right? Everything in our culture, special events of all around food. Every last one of them. Start, break it down, you'll find that. So when you put all three of these things together and you start mis mixing your genetics that affect behavior, that affect, come from effects from the environment, you get into essentially a vicious triad, a cycle of existence that unfortunately really cannot be beaten. It's a very down way to look at it, but it's a very real way to look at it. And what that makes all of us is not, um, not immune from making positive decisions for ourselves and owning our behaviors and responsibilities. Because at the end of the day, women, you didn't go choke your husbands for saying something like that. And men, you didn't go off and beat the other guy to death in road rage because he made you mad. We have control of our behavior by making choices. But those choices are affected and influenced at that nature through your environment and through behavior. So here are some things that come with too much body fat on you as I move on. Diseases that are associated with too much percentage body fat, they range from top to bottom from a very long list. But the ones that are considered the most life-threatening are the ones that affect cardiopulmonary function or cancer. So diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, respiratory failure to some degree, and cancer. Those are the biggest killers from obesity. The other problems that come on there typically won't kill you, they just make you miserable for all of your life. And they range from depression to menstrual irregularities, infertility, and not being able to have children, urinary stress incontinence, arthritis of your hips, knees, and ankles, uh, reflux, uh, gallstones, fatty liver disease. Fatty liver disease is now the number one cause of cirrhosis in our country and will be the number one cause of liver cancer in our country in no time flat. Beats alcohol bar none. So, most people walk around, don't even know it. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Stroke, um, all of these really wonderful things that come with the punishment for being so. Cancer. Obesity has been underestimated in terms of its influence on cancer. For women, risk factors for endometrial or uterine cancer and breast cancer are being shown related to obesity to be exponentially higher than appreciated. So much so that weight loss surgery in one study demonstrated a survival benefit purely based on the decreased risk of endometrial cancer. That just by itself was already proved benefit enough. Typically, weight loss surgery is better mortality associated with cardiovascular disease, but we're finding more and more of the cancer. For men uh, and women alike, cancer is typically esophagus, kidney, um, and colon cancers have obesity relations to them. There's a lot of, like, uh, science around why that might be but at the end of the day to you when you got cancer you don't really care about that anymore it's just a fight for your life now our program and the design of weight loss surgery is to either prevent these from happening or put these diseases associated with too much body fat into remission and get rid of them they weight loss surgery is the only thing demonstrated to do that it may not be sexy it may not look great, it may not be popular to talk about, but I love all the primary care providers out there and all the endocrinologists out there and all of the doctors and nurses and providers that are trying to do the best thing for all of you as patients. 
But when you're talking about weight-related diseases, you talk about blood pressure. Are they treating your blood pressure when they give you the pills? Or are they treating the numbers? When you're, you're giving you stuff for your diabetes, are they fixing the diabetes? Or are they just trying to get your blood sugar down? It's like when you get the flu. Do we treat the flu? Or we just treat your symptoms? We just treat your symptoms, actually. We let your body take care of the virus. So if you think about when you're talking about weight-related diseases, if it came with the weight and it goes away with the weight going away, why are we chasing pills and insulin? It may profit companies a lot, but it doesn't do anything for you. If you look at the epidemic in this country, more than 70% of us are overweight and approximately 40% of us are obese. Studies ago showed about 6.6% .6 of people were morbidly obese. That is going up. It's going up in the adolescent group faster than you can imagine. 21 to 24 percent of kids are overweight. 16 to 18 percent of them are obese. You put this in the frame of Europe. Europe is 50 percent overweight, 30 percent obese. So we're, we're worse than they are. But it's an industrialized process phenomenon for sure. It seemed to be the, the common thread. In 2005, there was a study that just came out recently when they put all these numbers and built the best model together and you couldn't realize that. Morbidity associated cost to our healthcare system was about 21% or $190 billion. Now, sitting there as you as an individual, and I as an individual too, who cares? I only care about my health. I don't really care about the cost. I don't want to talk about costs related to my health. Obesity related deaths account for 18% annually right now of deaths in this country. 2.8 million people die in the United States every year. That's about 475,000 people that die every year related to obesity diseases. And the worst part, treatable, right? Reversible. Something we can do about that for a lot of people where it's quite severe. In 1987, as the epidemic of obesity started to be recognized by public health entities, the National Institute of Health, Center for Disease Control, everybody, they got together and they asked the states, Start sending us height weight data on your patients anonymously. We don't want to know their names or their genders or anything about them, nothing private. We just want to know height and weight. Every time you see them, send that to us. So in 1987, they started looking around. The ones are white, they hadn't reported yet. But the blues kind of gave the percent of people that were obese in those states. Most everybody, as you can tell, were kind of the baby blue or the near baby blue. We forwarded it to 97, everybody's data is in. And now, not the light baby blue, but some baby blue, some real blue, and some of that kind of yellow color. So 20 to 24 percent of their population now were facing obesity. In 2007, you're now living in the healthiest state in the United States. We were the only blue state left. Some of them now verging on 30 percent or more obesity in each state. That was 2007, that's 13 years ago. It only took three more years for Colorado to join. Now, over 30%, they just kind of gave up on the color coding and said over 30%. According to the Center for Disease Control, the two un most unhealthy states in the United States, their obesity rates approximate 50%, Mississippi and West Virginia. We in the military group with our health care insurance through TRICARE that you've earned by your sacrifice or your service via yourself or your spouses, your family members, we don't have the same concerns as a lot of civilian people out there. You have a baseline income. You have resources available. You have wellness centers. You have these things. The civilian population does not. So obesity tends to be a disease of poor socioeconomically challenged folks which is why you look in West Virginia and you look a lot in the South, because what's down there? Cheap fried foods with people who can't afford to buy much. And that's where it goes. And basically, I think corporate profit is building off of buying them, I mean, they're profiting off these people's destruction of their health, essentially. What ends up happening? And they don't have a lot of choice about it all the before it's over. So what are things you're gonna face that you don't like every day? Climbing stairs, going through turnstiles, sitting in a movie, getting on a plane. Anybody ever gotten a look from somebody you're gonna sit down next to on the plane, they give you that look out of their eye and they kind of roll over like this, right? Judgment, scrutiny. These are things 
that affect quality of life, but what about your actual life expectancy? It's been well demonstrated. This only goes out to a BMI of 35, but there was a study in Sweden that's already demonstrated this to be further and further out. Severe obesity in adults is associated with a 5 to 20 year life reduction. You die 5 to 20 years younger than you should have, depending on the severity. And that 35 there, it's an exponential climb. It doesn't go in a straight line. BMI of 45 versus 40 is way unhealthier, right? 33 versus 28 is a little tiny bit of the curve there. But it's real. And it's very, very, very prominent. And we're seeing that in adolescents too. You see up there, if you're a teenager and you become an adult at 18 and your BMI is over 40, your life expectancy is 8 to 13 years shorter. And that's from all those diseases that come with them. So what can we do about that? Well, insurance companies, people like TRICARE, taxpayers, are paying for this. And they said, well, if you want to get up there, to include the medical community, they said, you want to get up there, Matt Mayfield, and tell everybody that weight loss surgery can save their life, prove it. Well, in 2000, uh, this was in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2015, they took 10,000 people. About 2,500 of them had surgery, the other 7,500 did not. And they just checked in every year to see if they were alive. And what you see up there in yellow is the surgery group, and in blue is the people who just stuck with the pills and the medicines and their CPAP machines. You see in the first year, the death rate for the surgery folks was higher. Surgery involves risk. That's what that's from. You do nothing, you just drive on. Now this is all comers. This is everybody. Sickest of the sick, biggest of the big, Mayo Clinic, everybody in the nation. These are 10,000 people, so it was for everybody where they included them. I will tell you that for us in this program at Evans Army Hospital, to my knowledge, we have only had two patients die in its tenure. One from incarcerated bowel, one from cardiopulmonary arrest. I, in my career, have had one patient die. I was at Fort Campbell in 2006 from a blood clot, went to the lung and killed her 33 days after surgery. There's very, very, very good demonstrated data that having weight loss surgery is just as safe as having your gallbladder out. It's really the same in terms of risk on that OR table. It is more dangerous for you to drive to the hospital on 115 or I-25 than it is to have the surgery. Point blank. Zero have died on the OR table. I guarantee you the number is greater than zero for died on I-25 or 115 every year. Right? So if you compare, that's the actual factual truth. But after that time frame was done on this curve, what you see is over time, the spread out of mortality for people who did nothing versus people who got their health back just kept getting bigger, 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 bigger. And so what that showed healthcare industry professionals, whether doctors or insurance companies, is yes, weight loss surgery saves people's lives. There's been three other studies that back this up. Uh, one also in Sweden, it was a Swiss, Swedish obesity subjects, SLS study, and they found somewhere between these two studies, mortality risk had to be decreased 30 to 40 percent compared to people who didn't have surgery. And that was from anything that killed them. Car wreck, cancer, didn't matter. It was all comers. The only thing was alive or dead. That was it. So, the real thing. Third study found it was like 89%, which is ridiculous. That's just, they were looking at a two year time frame. And I really don't know what's going on there. But probably most people would agree that your mortality goes down at about 30 to 40% related to weight loss surgery and getting healthy again. So when insurance companies started paying for it because they realized it was cheaper up front, They're, they want to make money too, but they make money off of not spending money on you. So they'll pay for your weight loss surgery. That's why TRICARE and Medicare does for taxpayer savings because it's cheaper to do that than to pay for the insulin and the CPAP for the next 20 years. You start adding that money up, it makes a big difference, it's not even close, okay? So, what I wanna know though, that's about money out there in the world and society, but what's it costing you, you personally? Well, anybody ever see the Jimmy Craig commercial? I think it's Jimmy Craig, where Valerie Bertinelli walks out in her red bathing suit and whips that thing off. I lost 45 pounds in six weeks on Jenny Craig. Blah, 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 blah. 
You ever read the asterisk in the fine print at the bottom of the screen and what it says? It says, results not typical. Ms. Bertinelli had a supervised medical diet, medical professionals, and a personal trainer, da 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 Because they can't tell you that that's what's typically happening in their programs. Here's what's typically happening in their programs. You look at Weight Watchers. So only about 35% of people drop out in a year. Of those that remain, at the one-year mark, they've lost an average of seven pounds. They don't advertise that to you. They want to show you results not to them. That's results to them. And the things I'm going to show you here shortly about results from weight loss surgery are all results typical. I have nothing to sell you. I don't make money off of doing this surgery with you. Right? I have to show you by science and by medical ethics what the risks are, the benefits are, and what you can expect to gain for the risk that you take and the work that you put in. So my results are going to be typical. You can have my atypical results, not typical, can be better or worse. Right? People not sticking to the program, not doing so great, maybe having a complication. Are people taking it to the house to the extreme and they do even better than they ever predicted? All of those are the results not typical. Of course, cost of clothing, cost of food. But this is the one that gets me. Now you might think that this is the uh, percentage increase in cost the more obese you get to the healthcare system. That's not what this slide means. Let's translate what that means. What it says is if your BMI is between 30 and 35, you use medicine about 25% more than, than the people who are of a healthier weight. You go over 35, it's 44%. As you can imagine, it gets more and more and more the bigger and bigger you get. It's not about money. What does this mean? That's your time. It's the time at the pharmacy. It's the time at the lab. It's the time going to the doctor. It's the time of your joint replacement. It's the time of everything that your health requires that it wouldn't require otherwise. Time is the one thing that's the most valuable thing in your life. You can't get it back once you give it up. And it's what everybody needs. I saw a sign the other day. How do you spell love? T-I-M-E. Right? How do you show somebody you love? You spend time with them. You give them your time because you can make more money. But you can't get time back once it's gone. That means the bigger you get, the more time you spend with me. And that's, I'm not good company. I'm here to tell you. Charlotte will tell you I'm terrible company. What are the other costs that come with that? So let's talk about these for a minute. A lot of people, I get patients all the time, they come in and say, oh, my mom or my, my husband said I'm taking the easy way out having surgery. Anybody heard that before? Taking the easy route. Okay, let's think about that for a second. What's the easiest thing to do? Nothing. Nothing. Just drive on. That's the easy thing to do. That's stupid. The hard thing to do is to say, I'm not healthy at this size, and I'm going to do something about it, which is going to take risk and sacrifice, and it's going to take a lot of work to get there. That's the hard thing to do. You have to kind of be humble to yourself for what's real, know where you're at, know your own behaviors, and be willing to take it on. Easy is just do nothing. Right? Selfishness. That's another one. A lot of guilt on women like that. Husbands go, you're just being selfish. I gotta take care of the kids. I gotta do these things while you do this. That's just selfish. Well, I already showed you that your life expectancy goes down the bigger you get. So which is more selfish to your family, your friends, your kids? Dying young or being around for the grandkids and college graduations and their birthdays? I would argue that being selfish actually is just letting yourself die younger. That's what's really selfish. Being selfless is taking care of your health, getting healthier so that you're there with your family and your friends and the people you care about. Relationships. Be 100% transparent about this. Weight loss surgery is, a, is associated with a significant number of lost relationships. And you won't always see those coming. Some of those will include marriages. Quite frankly, there's been some estimates out there that most, about probably half of marriages won't change, some will get better, others will end, related to the surgery. And you think, like, how can that be? I'm getting healthier? Well, it turns out maybe your partners liked you big. Maybe the thing that, you ever seen Everybody Loves Raymond when mom got upset when, when Raymond's wife started cooking? Because she comes over and says, the only thing I have to do in my life that gives me 
pleasure is cooked for you, right? So what happens whenever you can't, you know, the, the birthday party and the, the anniversary is they're not eating anymore. We gotta start looking for something else we have in common, right? I had a um, male and female alike. I had a, a woman come in and, and she was a patient. She said, I'm getting divorced. And I said, what happened? And she said, my husband told me that he has self-esteem issues, that when he deployed before, I was so big, he never worried about anybody hitting on me or me cheating on him. But now that I'm healthy, he can't deal with it. So that ended their marriage, right? Flip side, male gets healthy, woman comes in. The thing I loved, the thing I could share with you was eating and food. And now we don't have that in common and I don't really like you that much in the marriage. Might find friends out there Jealousy is a real thing. All of a sudden they see you getting healthy and you can't go to the pasta bar with them anymore. And you, they go, well, it turns out what people who drink, they like other people who drink because misery loves the company, right? People like to eat when they're big. They like to eat with other big people because guess what? If you, two of you at the table, that means you're only getting stared at half the time from people who are judging you from across the room, right? And you don't feel bad because the person you're with eats as much as you do. Right? So you can kind of end this thing together. Let's be honest about it. So those relationships change very quickly and can end very rapidly. Those social events I mentioned earlier that seem to evolve around food. What are you going to do now when you go to the birthday party? What are you going to do when you go to the Super Bowl party? When you go to Thanksgiving? It's here in a few weeks. Not going to be the same experience for you anymore. Not all about food anymore. Right? So what are you going to do with that time? What are you going to do with your energy and efforts? You have to have a plan for that. Otherwise, it's either temptation and let them kick it back in, or having to deal with stress and not knowing what to do with it. Right? When all it is is you're just getting healthy, but the price for it becomes very real because you don't get to enjoy that whole experience with your family. Some people ask, with weight loss surgery and the things that we do, whether we're simply taking someone's addictive behavior and obsession with food and trading it into something else that could be equitably harmful. The one thing that's different between alcoholism, drug addiction, those behavior patterns versus people who have to interact with food every day is quite simply this. You don't have to have heroin and alcohol to live. You have to eat to survive. So people who have food issues have to deal with that every single day of their life. And if you're losing that battle because the hormones won't let you win, you're going to have to continue to face it every day and you never get past it, right? So we have to start thinking about food as a nutrition for our bodies as animals rather than something that's a satisfaction for our behavior, social events, and our brain. So what are the options? Now we get into the particulars. Are you a candidate for weight loss surgery? So the National Institute of Health said over 40, the risk-benefit ratio is in your favor or a BMI over 35 if you had one of those four life-threatening conditions, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or sleep apnea. Those qualified you. You have to be healthy enough to actually survive and go through the operation. You can't have uncontrolled psychological issues or substance abuse issues. You have to have everybody on the team agree with you that it is the best thing in the interest of your health for you to do. You can't have a medical reason that we could reverse like a thyroid problem. Why would we put you through surgery if we could fix something else that fixes the problem for you, right? That's, that's not the point. And you had to have tried at least to make sure you're not in that micro percent that could do this on your own. Because even if it's 2%, that's one in 50, that's one person out of 50 who's not taking the risk of dying in surgery. So we want everybody to have tried on their own and gotten to a point where they're like, uncle, I give up. But the most important part is you have to be dedicated to the lifestyle change and the program that we're giving you. Because listen to me, no matter what we do in terms of surgery, it is a temporary tool you have to use to get healthy. It will not do it all for you. You have to stick to the program. And if you don't, it won't work. And you only get one shot at this. Not only from your healthcare insurance company, which TRICARE very specifically says, this is a one-time benefit, but ironically, we haven't found a second surgery that reinstitutes the weight loss if you put it back on. There's no other 
It's like your body knows you get one chance to trick it. And once it knows what you did, it won't let you do it again. It knows better. The brain figures it out somehow, some way. Doesn't really apply. So when it comes to surgery, there's two kind of philosophies of what we look at. Not letting you eat or drink as much, or not letting you absorb what you eat and drink, or both. Restrictive surgeries, most classically now is a sleep hysterectomy. Historically, they've been the lap band, which is, pardon the pun, have been abandoned. They're not put anymore. Can't even get them. I've removed a ton. I never put one in for the record because I knew they weren't going to work. Um, if they did work for the person, I would argue anything would have worked for them. The person's going to use the tool no matter what you gave them. Uh, the complication rate's too high, never really got enough weight off, and people all have them removed later, and it's just not a good idea. Restricted procedures, in theory, keep you from being able to even drink as much as you want. It's quite simply that. Uh, you, your smaller pouches or smaller stomachs get full, you feel fuller fast, and you don't have any issues with that. There is no such thing as a purely malabsorptive procedure, or a procedure where you don't absorb things you eat and drink. These were the initial surgeries done in the 50s, 60s that gave weight loss surgery a bad name. They had people that malnourished and died. They were randomly experimenting with how much to bypass in the system, where basically at some point, they were literally taking the beginning of the intestine and hooking it straight to the midsection of the colon. So basically what you ate, 20 minutes later was coming out, and they got malnourished and died. Turns out our bodies need the nutritional elements and things we eat. That has uh, been remedied in terms of the gastric bypass, we'll get to it in a second. Um, but no one does a purely malabsorptive procedure anymore, at all. We do do combination procedures, and that's where we restrict how much you can eat and drink and bypass a certain amount of intestine to induce further weight loss, um, and you don't absorb everything that you take in. So classic example is that, the gastric bypass. It's been around around probably 40 years or so now. Uh, there's a couple other ones out there that are being investigated or studied, biliopancreatic um, diversion and the loop duodenal switch, which actually is not a covered benefit yet. That's going to be further down the line. We in, in weight loss surgery are trying to figure out a second surgery or for people who are that desperate and need to lose that much weight, what the kind of, how far can we push that envelope? But the thing you have to know about these, the more drastic the surgery, the more weight loss, also the more risk, and the lesser quality of intestinal life that follows it. So, you know, people may lose a lot more weight, but they have diarrhea every day, whereas people with a sleep, they don't have that problem, right? You didn't, didn't do all that much to them to rearrange things, where a duodenal switch, and they have seven bowel movements a day that stinks and is full of fat. It's just a thing, it's part of it. So, it's a price to pay, nothing's free. Of any abdominal surgery, whether it's a gallbladder, or uh, intestine, or weight loss surgery, they come with certain risks. Standard risk of any operation, bleeding, infection, pain, scar, injury to other structures in the area. Anyone we cut the connective tissue open, you can get a hernia from that. Uh, shoulder pain is typically from the gas irritating the diaphragm because we do all of these surgeries with a video camera through small incisions that inflate with carbon dioxide and we do the work inside. The safest surgery is actually to cut you wide open, but we trade a little bit of safety for a whole lot of benefit in terms of speed of recovery, hernia risk from the cuts, pain post-op, all of the things that are far more beneficial to trade that little bit of risk for. Uh, pneumonia, if you're not getting out of bread, bed and breathing and walking around and doing the things. Uh, relations to the complication from anesthesia or an allergic reaction medicine you didn't know you had. I put DVT and PE in big red letters up there. The number one killer of weight loss surgery patients is blood clots going to your lungs and killing you. I am so scared of blood clots, as is most of the weight loss surgery community out there. We give you blood thinners in the pre-op area before you go to surgery. Now, think about that. You're going to surgery where we're worried about you bleeding, but we're going to give you blood thinners. It's because I'm more scared of blood clots than I am of bleeding. I've been in Afghanistan three times. I fix bleeding. Right? Bleeding is pesky. Clots kill you. I can't do anything with dead. So I would rather risk the bleeding part and take that on than risk the blood clot part. So much so that when you're out of surgery, we have you up and moving within hours. And you're still on those blood thinner shots and you have the massagers on your legs. We're doing everything possible. If we put your health conditions and your size into a calculator to determine whether we keep you on blood thinners even when you go home. It's the number one killer. It's everything we're scared of in the short run. 
I mentioned other things, uh, injury to the area, uh, need to do open traditional surgery, or dying, right? We talked about that earlier. It's actually more dangerous to drive in the hospital. When it comes specifically to weight loss surgery, there are some more risks that are specific to that, things that can go wrong. So um, hernias from the cuts, chest pain. Your stomach, your actual stomach, not your intestines, everybody thinks this is your stomach. The stomach, the actual stomach itself, lives behind your breastplate. You will have chest pain when I operate on it. It will feel like chest pain to a lot of people. You're not having a heart attack, right? Um, collapsed lung, if you have a hiatal hernia that's undiagnosed and discovered at the time of surgery, we fix that then. Uh, it's very well demonstrated you need to fix it then. You gotta get the stomach and things back down in the abdomen and out of the chest so we can do your weight loss surgery. And doing that, the lungs are sitting here and your stomach's sitting there, and we pull it down and get everything out of there, you can, I shouldn't say that, you can interrupt the lining around the lung that gives you a collapsed lung. I've never had that happen, but in theory it can. It's not a lung injury itself, it's the lining around the lung. Change in bowel habits. When you're not eating very much, you may only go to the bathroom every three days. You may feel like you're constipated. You may have change in your bowel habits. Probably 90% of people do after weight loss surgery. Most of it is temporary, some of it can be long term. It has to be something you manage through. Dehydration, if you're not eating and drinking enough and staying on top of the program after surgery. Gallstones, even if you don't have gallstones in your gallbladder, rapid weight loss, like with weight loss surgery, is associated with forming them in a significant population that ultimately may end up needing to have the gallbladder removed. Food intolerance. Babies throw up a lot. Their brain, their eyes, and their stomach are learning what they can take in, how fast, how big, and what they like. And even though they can't tell you about it, they don't like some things, and they throw them up. There is no blood test for who likes lima beans or who likes squash. You may find after weight loss surgery that there are food reactions that you can have that are weird, or foods that you used to like that now you hate, foods that you used to hate that now you like, things that smell that you smell them and it doesn't sit well with you, makes you nauseated. Um, if I, I've had a patient come in and told me one time, it's the weirdest thing, if I eat um, anything that's got fiber in it, like an apple, I'm in the bathroom 20 minutes later and I literally see the apple come through me. I can't absorb it anymore. But every other fruit I'm fine with, I can't explain that. But it happens, right? It's a trial and error process. Uh, with bypasses in particular, because you're not absorbing things normally anymore, you can have vitamin mineral deficiencies. That is not a real thing so long as you take your vitamins and supplements the way you're supposed to, right? All you gotta do is stick to the program. You can have swelling of the GI tract. Um, anytime we're hooking things up, they can narrow down or be too narrowed as we go. Um, you might require more surgery. We'll even talk about that in a little while. Ulcers along the intestinal tract, ulcers along the stomach. Um, not absorbing alcohol well anymore. I've heard from a lot of patients that after weight loss surgery, particularly after bypasses, they're the cheapest drunks around. About two drinks and they're drunk. Now that I've told you that, if you go to a wedding in Cripple Creek and have a glass of wine and get a DUI afterwards, no, I will not write you a letter for the judge explaining that you got drunk too easy because of your weight loss surgery. I said that for a reason because yes, that actually happened. On a more serious note, however, particularly for women, um, because alcohol can affect you uh, more substantially, you need to understand that you could be putting yourself at risk for assault if you're in the wrong environment and you get drunk faster than you realize. So be cognizant of that for your safety, okay? It can make you very intoxicated very quickly. Um, leak from the GI tract along the staple line or anywhere we're hooking one structure to another. We do test those in the operating room, but we need Mother Nature to do her part and heal them purely um, sealed. So the first example here are the two surgeries that we're here to talk about. The vertical sleeve gastrectomy. This uh, initially was discovered by accident. It was a surgery done for the super high risk, super big folks to get some weight off of them uh, and get them to a healthier place so they could do the second part of the procedure which was typically a biliopancreatic diversion. And what these folks discovered was a lot of folks never needed that second part. So the thought came around like, well, why don't we just do this? And so around 2010, it started to become a mainstay of something to do. Around 2015, I think TRICARE started approving it as a benefit. So very simply, we go into the video camera and inflate your abdomen. There's a series of small cuts. All cuts, no matter which surgery we're talking about, range in size from about six or seven millimeters 
up to about half an inch, maybe an inch at most. I have to have somewhere with a sleeve to get the actual stomach out. That's usually the reason for the, the big incision, which is like that, is because I gotta have somewhere to get the thing out of it. The remaining of the incisions are only this big. We have small instruments, they're tiny, things that we need to use when we get in there. So it is the most commonly performed surgery across the country nowadays. I think some people estimate it at about 60, 66%, somewhere in that range. Mean excess weight loss in our program in a year is usually around 60 to 70%. That is not 60 to 70% of your weight as you sit there. It's 60 to 70% of your extra weight that you're carrying around. And I can go over later how you figure that number out so that you have expectations of what your weight loss would be. Um, when, when put head to head with a gastric bypass, the, the potential need for surgery later on down the line, whether it be from a complication or gallstones or whatever, uh, sleeve gastrectomies have been demonstrated to have a lower uh, reoperation rate. Most commonly, it's for reflux after your sleeve. The range in all literature is about 8 to 15 percent. For bypasses, it's 15 to 22 percent, most commonly from internal hernias or intestines slipping into places they wouldn't ordinarily be able to go because we rearranged you. Um, I will tell you that in our program, when we audit the data, it, the, the reoperation rates aren't near that high. Some of that may be because our patients PCS and move off and we never know what happened. Uh, but for the most part, we truly just believe that our patient population is typically smaller in terms of the, the, the world out there. We're limited, we don't do BMIs for guys over 55 or women over 60. We don't do the biggest of the big. Um, and, and the things that we do in our programs have a better outcome because of the center of excellence stuff and things like that. Um, so our, our rates are probably down in the three to five percent range, something like that. Don't know an exact number. So this is supposed to have a video, but video doesn't trigger in here, so I'm just going to tell you. How is the sleeve gastrectomy done? So first incision is above the belly button, it's about that big typically. We go in, we put a uh, port in, and we inflate your abdomen with carbon dioxide. That gives everybody the sensation after surgery like they're bloated or swollen or need to pass a bunch of gas. It's your brain perceiving what happened to you being stretched out. We put a video camera in through your belly button. We put in four other incisions that are the tiny ones, one in the left abdomen, one below the breastplate, one in the right abdomen, and one just above, below the rib cage here. Uh, we go inside, we lift your liver off your stomach. We identify the stomach, we take down all of its attachments along one side. The anesthesia service put a sizing tube down your throat. We put that sizing tube over on the side of the stomach and we chop off all the extra while sticking the stapler right next to it, a series of staples. We take the excess stomach, which is about 90% of your stomach, out. So originally a human being's stomach can handle about 1 liter to 1,500, so 1,000 to 1,500 cc's. Now it can hold about 100 cc's, or roughly the size of a banana. Um, we remove the rest out. Uh, and then we sew you up with stitches, let all the gas out, sew you up with stitches, and take you to recovery. Average time of operation for a sleeve is generally kind of 60 to 90 minute range. Depends on how big you are, depends on whether you've had surgery before, depends on height of hernia, a lot of things, but that's kind of the typical average. So, risk and complications from sleeves in particular. Some of these are generic, some of them I'll just tell you, kind of, I've never seen it or I've seen it. Uh, we talk about hernias and chest pain, constipation, diarrhea, dehydration, uh, issues with the medications, those are pretty generic, getting gallstones. Um, stricture of the sleeve, or the sleeve scarring down to a much narrower diameter than it was built can happen. Uh, that's typically treatable with uh, EGD down your throat where we just stretch it with a balloon and stretch it back open to where it gets to a certain size. Rarely it can require another operation. Stretching on the stomach, 100% of the time. Over time, your sleeve will get bigger. We're trying to starve you to health, not starve you to death. It's supposed to do that. Gastric bypass pouches, the same thing. They're not built to stay that way forever. Uh, vomiting and nausea, 100% guaranteed you'll have nausea after surgery. So much so we give you drugs whether you want them or not to try to minimize that chance. Nausea is just a thing when you have drugs, when you have us manipulating the stomach, and then you have us manipulating the stomach with you on drugs. So you're going to have nausea. Vomiting is actually not that common um, after a sleep, but it can happen. Um, we just try to nurse you through it and get you to the other side. Ulcers along the staple line, leaks along that staple line, um, or stricture as I, I mentioned. Vitamin and, and mineral deficiencies really aren't seen all that much with sleeves because we're not rerouting you in any way, form, or fashion. From your mouth to your bottom is originally the way you're made. But some of the factors that the stomach secretes that help you absorb certain minerals 
can be affected, so it's still important that you take your supplements and your vitamins appropriately. Acid reflux, I mentioned a minute ago the reoperation rate. Very, very common for people to get acid reflux to some degree, most of which is very tolerable for people after having weight loss surgery. Initially, with sleeves, people that had reflux, they wouldn't offer them to them because they thought they were going to make them miserable. It turns out when the weight goes away, the reflux goes away for most everyone. So it's not a reason not to have a sleeve if you have reflux. But it can make it worse in the short run, and you have to know that. Mesenteric vein thrombosis. That's in red up there. And I will tell you why. It is a rare complication. You can have it with bypasses or sleeves, but it's more common apparently in sleeves. All comers, they risk it, they're laying it out one to three percent, something like that. It usually shows up about two weeks after surgery as moderately intolerable abdominal pain, bloating and nausea. What happens is the veins that drain either the spleen or the intestines will develop a blood clot in it, and that blood clot will extend up into the liver. Sometimes it's treatable with blood thinners. Sometimes it requires a procedure to get the blood clot out. Sometimes it requires an actual surgery because intestine will die. It can be fatal. We have seen it twice here. One patient was about a week and a half ago. And the weird part about this, the scariest thing to me about this, it's nowhere near where we were doing surgery. It wasn't from the surgery. Like an actual the stomach was up here. It's like saying, you know, you were at a protest in Denver and there was a fire in Boca Raton, Florida. You're like, well, I wasn't there. That's not my fault. But they're associated with one another somehow. We don't understand why, but you can have blood clots formed in veins away from the place way later on, down the line. She was doing great for two straight weeks. The other one that we had, um, she ended up in Denver, lost her spleen, her spleen had burst from the pressure for the veins being clotted off. Um, she almost died. She's alive and well. Um, but so much so that even though it's rare, since we've seen it a couple times, we put it on the slide because it's, it's truly just that scary to me more than anybody else. Um, the patient that had it, by the way, I saw her today. She's doing fine. She's going to be just fine. But it was, she said, the look on your face when you saw me in the ER was not good. I'm like, yeah, that wasn't good for me either, I promise you. Key to the program here, as we with both of them, the diet's strict and you have to stick to the game plan for it to work. When people have sleep destructomies, if for whatever reason you mentally felt like you wanted to destruct, self-destruct, you can beat the sleeves quite easily. It is more dependent upon your compliance than the other operation, probably because it's less punitive. You can drink a milkshake right through that thing. With a bypass, you'll take one sip of that milkshake and you will not do that again. So, in evaluating the surgery that you think is best for you in terms of your weight loss goals, and we'll explain in a little while what's coming on the last slides, you need to be honest with yourself about the size of the tool that you need and the behaviors that you have to fight against when it comes to what you're going to choose. The gastric bypass has been around about 40 years, second most commonly performed surgery done. Mean excess weight loss is about a 10% bigger bang for the buck, about 70 to 80%. There are some series out there that say diabetic control after a sleeve and a bypass are the exact same. Those, those studies involve 200 to 250 patients. A much larger study that came out recently suggests that gastric bypasses are better for diabetic control and remission than the sleeve is. So that's why I put it is, but I put a question mark because it's a lot of debate about that, but it's probably true. People perceive of complication rates being higher with gastric bypass. They are higher than sleeves, but they're not high. It's actually a low complication rate. It's selection bias. What you end up having is you hear the horror story about somebody who had really bad stuff go down with their gastric bypass. You don't hear about the other 40 who didn't, right? That's kind of what happens. So people have a lot of perception because this has been around for 40 years, they've heard a story here and there, and they think that's the mainstay of truth. That would be like saying you don't drive because you've heard of car wrecks that are really atrocious. Yes, they happen, but statistically it's safe to drive a car. So how's the gastric bypass done? It involves six incisions, two of which are the small ones, four of which are which the half-inch ones. Inflate with carbon dioxide just the same. We go inside, we find the intestine, we divert somewhere between 100 and 150 centimeters of it. We go up to the top of the stomach, we make a pouch about the size of a chicken egg, and we hook the intestines up to there, and we rehook them to themselves downstream. That's kind of simply how it's done. We pull the camera and everything back out, we staple you up, and we get you to recovery. 
Average time of operation with a bypass is probably about 120 minutes. I've done them as fast as 90. I've seen one done in, in 45, but that doesn't mean it's the safest one. Typically 90 to 120 minutes is about the average. Um, that being said, with any of these surgeries or any surgery I do for any human being for any reason, the generic answer from me when they say, how long does this take? It takes however long it takes to do safely for you. This is like a flight. If I need 10 minutes to go around bad weather for your safety, we're taking that 10 minutes. If I catch a tailwind and we get to the gate five minutes early, great. What matters was safe takeoff, safe flight, safe landing. Everybody alive and happy. Not doing you any good if we're hurt you and kill you in the process just to try to do it a little bit quicker. That makes no sense whatsoever. Okay, risks and complications from the bypass. All of them are generically the same I mentioned before for bariatric surgery in general. But here, uh, at least along the staple lines, we're hooking that pouch straight to intestine. So the little bit of acid that that pouch makes will go straight out of the intestine. People can get ulcers from that. Um, you will need more persistent vitamin and mineral nutrition and surveillance because we are bypassing some of the intestine. You have to stick to the program so long as you do, it's not an issue. The remainder of the stomach, where the sleeve, we take 90% of it out. When we make your pouch and a bypass, we leave the rest of the stomach in there. You can't get to that stomach with the video camera down your throat anymore. It's not hooked to the system. That is not, it's been studied whether people get gastric cancer later in life and don't know it. No, that doesn't happen. It's perfectly safe to leave it there, but that's what you end up getting. Dumping syndrome, that's the one in red. The reason I put that in red is because that's the one I told you, you won't take more than one drink of a milkshake with that thing. It's probably more effective in terms of its weight loss and its diabetic control because this operation will punish you for doing the wrong things. People who are experiencing dumping syndrome, classically what happens is you take in a complex carbohydrate, which you're not supposed to eat, and you get a massive rush of fluid into the intestinal tract, and you experience what would feel like a hypoglycemic attack. So that is sweating, dizzy, nauseating, diarrhea, feeling like you're gonna pass out, extreme weakness, all of those symptoms. And you get it twice. So you get it once, and then about 20 minutes later you get it again. That one is a true hypoglycemic attack because you only took in a little bit of sugar, your pancreas made insulin, your sugar gets chewed up pretty quickly, but the insulin hangs out longer than the sugar did, so your blood sugars go down and you experience it all over again. I used to joke and say, if I do your gastric bypass and you don't lose weight, I will give you my annual salary in cash because you can't beat me. You will lose weight. Sleeve, I've had a patient lose 10 pounds and say she got tired of it and doesn't want to do it anymore and she quit. And you would think, what, what? And yeah, I remember her name like it was yesterday. And truly just first post-op visit, I don't feel like doing this, and just walked out. Couldn't do anything about it. Dumping syndrome is a real thing. Uh, most people, I will tell you, that have bypasses, they, they test it at some point in time. And I tell them not bother calling when it happens. I'm just going to laugh at you, probably, and tell you not to do that again. Because um, we all know that's what happens. Diet strict, got to stick to the program. The stay in the hospital is the same for both surgeries. Um, the typical return to going to work, to your activity with your family, is the same for both surgeries. Because we're talking 30 minutes difference in the OR, consider the surgeries in terms of time the same. They are virtually all the same. Not, not one's going to get you out any quicker than the other. Pain, post-op pain, the same between the two of them. Most people, particularly women, tell me, particularly if they've had children or previous surgeries, that this surgery is not near as painful as they thought it would be. Men, it's a mixed bag. Um, Probably because we don't have kids, right? We don't, and we're not as tough as women are, to be quite frank. Um, I've had guys that were like, nah, it wasn't that bad, and I've had some of them that you'd have thought I chopped their arm off. It's the same exact surgery for everybody. I really don't have a description for that. So how do you make this choice between the two? Considerations that I mentioned a little while ago, age, your health um, problems that you're trying to fight, the amount of weight you need to lose to get you healthy, the lifestyle that you lead, and what your eating behaviors are. I don't spend more than this time with you. You have to figure out for yourself and be honest. When it's one o'clock in the morning and you're staring at the ceiling and you can't sleep and you say, be honest with yourself, how did I get here? You have to answer that question because that will tell you what size tool you need. If you go, every time I've ever tried and lose weight, carbs, they come back and get me. 
then you really need to be honest and think about a bypass because you, that will protect you from that, right? If it's a, I do pretty good, I just like to eat. I love big portions, I just like to eat. I can eat healthy even, I just like eating a lot of it. Well, a sleeve's a pretty good trick for that because you ain't gonna eat that much that fast through that thing, right? You don't really need that big old tool. You just need this one thing that fixes your one issue. So you have to be honest with yourself. Ultimately, it is a decision that you and I come to together. I would ask for family and friends in the site if you think that would be worthwhile. Um, I typically say I let you decide for the most part. I've only ever had one patient disagree with me, um, and she admitted later that she was wrong um, after she'd been in the hospital for about a month. So uh, typically, it's you, you get a feel for this during this whole path as you go through this whole experience before surgery. You get to the end and come in and see me and kind of go, I think I know what I want. Probably about 10% of people come in and go, I'm going to do whatever you tell me to. I need you just to decide for me. All right? And there's some times where it's, it's a no-brainer, and there's other times where it's, you're going to live with your choice, so you tell me. As long as I'm not doing something wrong for you, I'll do what you want me to do for you. Now, if it's clearly wrong, if you're a super brittle diabetic and you need to lose 200 pounds, a sleeve is not going to get you there. That is the wrong thing to do. I'm not going to do that. Um, just kind of one of those things, all right? So, results, typical. Let's talk about what really it ends up being for you. We take on these risks, we talk about all these things that can go wrong, and the surgery and the sacrifice you're going to have to go through and the pain. What can I expect? Well, if you compare placebo, all right, or just the diet and exercise thing, that whole, well, oh, just eat less and do more. Well, here's what you really get. So diet and behavior modification, average weight loss at a year is about 8 to 12 percent. People can lose that much weight. Placebo is 4 to 6. But look at that. Uh, Tenure mark, it's 1.6 percent will maintain that weight loss. Everybody fails. It comes back. You can't eat it. That left the thing gets you. You never outdo your hormones. Very rare, I should say. Drugs like fentramine, the ACG diet, some of them have been demonstrated to be very efficacious. They work. Here's the problem. What do you think happens when you stop taking it? The weight comes back. The variable that you changed to get you healthier now is gone. It comes back. So, the gastric bypass and the sleeve gastrectomy, weight loss in a year. Other studies, I told you for our program, it averages around 60 to 70. There's other studies that say they get to about 70 to 80 percent excess weight loss. I think that's some because they have bigger folks. They have more weight to go. Uh, gastric bypass can be anywhere 65 to 85. At the five-year mark, excess weight loss hovers around 60% for bypasses and is somewhere in the literature, 53 to 57, so we kind of say 50 to 60% excess weight loss um, after weight loss surgery. That is how much weight you can expect using the tool on the bell curve to lose. Results typical. As I said, time in the hospital averages two days for both. In our program, almost bar none, it's two days. Occasionally, with either surgery, someone will be there a third day if they're really fighting nausea or they're real fighting real hard to try to stay hydrated. Occasionally, where they have something else that happens. Right? So, kind of average. Surgery can help change your life. It can improve or resolve those diseases. It is the only thing demonstrated to do that. It decreases mortality risk. 30 to 40% chance less that you will die from a health-related associated problem. You will spend less time in the healthcare system so you have more time with your family and clearly have a better quality of life associated with your weight. Okay? However, I'm going to say it again, it's just a tool. Right? It's just a tool. Long-term maintenance. Here's the da dum dump to the other side. I mentioned earlier in the slides about the diseases that were on there, but you'll notice I put Maybe not illness, though. The difference between illness and disease is quite simply this. Illness is when someone feels poorly. Disease is something that's hurting your body, hurting your existence. So we think of those things typically as going together. You get pneumonia, you feel like bad, and you have the flu inside you, you know, pneumonia bug or something. Uh, you get appendicitis, your belly hurts, and you have a problem here. You typically go hand in hand, and vice versa. No diseases, you feel great. No illness. The scariest things in the world and some of the biggest, most life-threatening health problems are the things that give you no illness 
but are very clearly diseases. Most classically, what that means is you have something that's hurting you, but you feel fine. Diabetes, walking around with blood sugar at 250, feel perfectly fine. High blood pressure, 190 over 100, feel perfectly fine, right? High cholesterol, no heart attack, no chest pain, feel perfectly fine. Sleep apnea, maybe a little tired, but I feel pretty much okay. Cancer, by the time you have symptoms from cancer, guess what? Way too late. By the time you get illness from your cancer, you're dead, right? I think everybody knows stage four, not as good as stage one, right? So those are very real things. When it comes to weight regain, it's the same thing. You feel fine, but that process inside you hormonally is happening. Those weight hunger hormones will come back. The leptin will come back. Very well demonstrated with weight loss surgery that we send them surging and pumping. But the body figures it out and they slowly come back over time. So you get that about 12 to 18 months to get healthy. Then you gotta start sticking from the weight loss phase to the weight maintenance phase. The threat of weight regain seems to be higher with the sleeve. Weight regain, as I mentioned, within 5% of what you started at. So we're about two and a half to three and a half percent for, for bypasses. That's probably because it punishes you for doing things with processed foods, whereas sleeves, it doesn't. So sleeves, it takes a lot more commitment to the program and a lot more compliance long-term. There are no do-overs. I mentioned that earlier. Your body only lets you do it once as far as we can tell, and your healthcare insurance, insurance company is not gonna pay for it twice. The things that have been shown scientifically to enable you to beat your hormones is your brain in positive action. It's the, I'm not gonna go choke my husband, I'm not going to go punch that guy for road rage. You make conscious decisions. I think we can all agree, and I don't mean to make this sound like something from the pulpit, but I think that we can all agree that doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is not smart. Eyeballing your calories and guesstimating your weight did not work well. At some point in time, what got us here was way too many calories and somewhere losing track and control of your weight. What you don't measure, you can't manage. So we're going to do something different this time around. You're going to take on that risk, use that tool, get rid of these health problems, get healthy. To stay there, you're going to have to watch your calories and watch your weight for the rest of your life. It is a lifelong problem. Your brain wants to get you big again. Your brain wants you to survive. It doesn't understand that it's actually hurting you, I don't think. Okay? So you have to stick to the program of watching those things because the metabolism for each of you is different. So you have to watch over time and know where you're at. And I have patients come in and they're like, I put on 30 pounds, but I wasn't eating and doing anything different. And I go, I believe you. And they're like, but I put on 30 pounds. And I'm like, what's up with the cast on your leg? He's like, oh yeah, I broke my leg. I've been laying around for a month. Burning less calories, dude. It's the balance. You gotta watch. How long have you been weighing yourself? I don't. What you don't measure, you can't manage. You have to pay attention to it, right? And if you didn't before, that's kind of how we got here. Staying active, um, staying on top of things, key. So, results typical. When it comes to those four diseases that can kill you up front, it's been measured with weight loss surgery with weight related things, uh, diabetes, your re remission and improvement rates. 70s and 80s percent going away, done in remission. Blood pressure, 60s and 70s, go from four pill to one, or not any anymore at all, or never being able to get control, but now having control with one pill. Uh, cholesterol, same thing. Cholesterol thing is a little bit harder because there is some genetic component of cholesterol that we're not gonna fix your genes doing this. Sleep apnea, same thing. Big heavy chest, don't have a big heavy chest anymore, a lot easier to breathe. Incidentally, the data is gonna come out and show, you know what, one of the most common risk factors for death with COVID is? You got it. Obesity, severe obesity. Chest so big, can't breathe. And when you have something that affects your lungs, you're on a respirator and can't breathe, you die. So it's going to be very well published about that. A couple other things by virtue of TRICARE, just to let you know, cosmetic surgery after weight loss surgery is not a covered benefit. There are some isolated instances where reconstructive surgery, not for cosmetic benefit, but for reconstruction and functional purposes, can be done with excess skin on the abdomen, 
uh, or things related to the breasts, arms, and thighs. They're, they're possible, but you just have to understand the taxpayers, all of us in this room are taxpayers, we don't pay for cosmetic surgery for each other. Tummy tucks and boob jobs and, and butt lifts, and I, that is not what we spend tax dollars on. So, not a covered benefit, it won't be a covered benefit. I've heard people say silly things like they thought it was part of the package with weight loss surgery, or they thought that um, they heard everybody gets one cosmetic surgery in their TRICARE life. None of that is true, right? Pregnancy, if you are a childbearing age, you must have a plan for not getting pregnant in the first 24 months after surgery. When you're starving and getting healthy is not the time to try to be feeding something growing inside you. There's no evidence that long-term there's any harm to fetuses related to people who have gotten pregnant, but they have horrible pregnancies because they're, you think morning sickness is bad? Throw in, throw it up in the sleeve as well on top of it and see what that's like. And you can't stay hydrated for you or baby, it becomes a disaster, right? If you have a bypass, oral contraceptive pills won't work like they used to. They seem to work fine with sleeves. You can't take those things or other hormones around the six week time frame of surgery. They're shown to increase the risk of blood clots. So that's a real thing we have to talk about. So 24 months, we recommend you have to have a plan. It's not a religious thing. We're not telling you how to do it. You just have to have a plan of some kind, okay? I will tell you the most common scenario, we do somewhere between 75 and 125 of these a year. And probably two or three times a year, I get a phone call of someone in the first 12 months that's pregnant. And the story, about 67% of the time, is the same. It goes like this. Well, um, before, uh, I couldn't get pregnant, and I talked to my doc, or uh, fertility guy, and he said I couldn't get pregnant. So I didn't worry about having a plan because I couldn't get pregnant. Well, why do you think they couldn't get pregnant? Their size. And they started losing weight, and they got healthy. Their ovaries turned back on. They started making eggs to get pregnant. If you look at infertility and weight loss surgery, they cite for a gastric bypass. If you have weight-related infertility, the cure rate for a gastric bypass is 100%. Like, women of childbearing age go back to being fertile. Adipose tissue is an estrogen precursor. For men, that's why they get boobs, right, have that kind of look. For women, it's a precursor. That's probably why the breast and uterine cancer rates are higher. It's a precursor of estrogen, so you're overstimulated. Your ovaries shut down because they think there's too much estrogen in you already. They don't work on you. Start getting that body fat on you. They kick back off. The hormones start getting regulated. Here it comes. So it's one of those things where, like, told you, um, you had to have a plan for that because don't take. If you've ever heard, I can't get pregnant. Don't believe that. Wait for 24 months and then tell me that 24 months down the line that's not working. And then that's a real thing. Until then, assume it's your weight. Okay. Okay. So what are your next steps? Well, that completes the seminar for today. Um, there again, I thank everybody for being here. I finished about 15 minutes faster uh, than I normally do. Uh, but from here, if you feel like weight loss surgery may be uh, key to you restoring your health, getting rid of health conditions, improving your quality of life, and it's things that's something that you could use as a tool to get healthy, please continue through our program. Uh, go to all the consults, go to the evaluations, and when you're done, come and see me. Let's talk about how we get you healthy. Thanks for being here. I'll field questions now if you want to turn that off.